It is such a pleasure to be back here today to see so many friends and former colleagues from Kansas days. Thank you so much to Randy uh, for asking me and to all the folks at the Center for East Asian Studies for facilitating this trip. Uh, it is also a joy to be back on this campus. Uh, it is only since I left uh, uh, Northeast Kansas that I've come to recognize uh, what a great institution JCCC is uh, compared to the community colleges in other cities I've lived in subsequently. Uh, and so I just want to say uh, to those of you all uh, who are based here uh, that you really have something wonderful and this is a gem uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this region. Now being asked to give a talk of only 45 minutes on a topic as big and unruly uh, as Japanese popular culture can be uh, is quite a challenge. When I wrote my uh, textbook, uh, Japanese Popular Culture and Globalization, I think it's about eight years ago uh, that I wrote uh, this book, I thought I was really accomplishing a lot by getting all of it down into about a hundred pages uh, of text. Uh, and even just in those eight years since I wrote it, the amount of literature uh, on uh, Japanese pop culture has exploded. Uh, and of course we're chasing a moving target as well, uh, since uh, folks in the Japanese entertainment industry keep churning out more stuff. Uh, so the themes and the material that needs to be covered uh, continues uh, to proliferate. A year ago, of course, uh, Pokemon Go would not even have been a word we would have recognized, uh, and now it just makes sense to have it uh, in the title uh, today. So what I wanted to do in this short time I'm with you uh, is give as much of a 30,000 foot view of the Japanese popular culture landscape as I could, while occasionally zooming in to look at some detail. Because as interesting as the big picture might be, really I think what draws people uh, to Japanese pop, what certainly for me resonates, uh, are those specific examples, that rich texture uh, of what's actually happening in specific products. So I'll try and balance it as best I can. And as I thought about organizing my comments today, what I thought I would do uh, is break them down into ten points uh, regarding Japanese pop culture. Uh, and if time grows short, I'll say, yeah, I said eight points at the beginning, didn't I? You know, and we can cut it uh, at that point. Uh, but I think these are all significant points in understanding and teaching uh, about Japanese pop. Each one of them uh, could be a lecture or indeed a book uh, in its own right. Uh, so I won't do any of them particular justice, but hopefully they can be a springboard for you all as you're thinking about how you might adapt Japanese pop uh, to your courses, uh, to your uh, teaching, uh, and uh, help uh, your students and help yourself uh, understand it a little bit better. If that sounds good, let's get rolling with number one. Japanese pop culture has a long and rich history. While the origins of Japanese popular culture are often traced back to the Tokugawa period, so early modern Japan, 1600 to 1868, a time of really unprecedented peace in Japanese history, a time of urbanization, Japanese cities, particularly uh, Edo, the forerunner of Tokyo, growing very rapidly, a time of considerable prosperity, especially for the commercial classes, for merchants living in those cities, and a time when there was a large elite in Japan, the samurai, the warrior class, uh, with a lot of spare time on their hands, uh, a lot of time to be amused uh, by popular culture. And in this rich environment, cities, money, elites with time to spare, we saw this blossoming of popular cultural forms. In areas like theater, uh, this is the time when Kabuki and Bunraku puppet theater uh, came into their own. It was a time of great creativity uh, in the graphic arts, uh, in woodblock prints, uh, especially well known were ukiyo-e, the uh, pictures of the floating world, images uh, of the entertainment quarters uh, in Edo during the Tokugawa period. And it's also time when Japanese sports uh, developed, things like sumo wrestling. Uh, really began uh, to emerge. In 1854, of course, that fine-looking specimen of a man, uh, Commodore Perry, arrived in Edo Bay. Japan was opened to the west. 
And from the start, there really was a two-way dialogue in culture uh, between uh, Japan and the outside uh, world. So from the start, uh, European and American audiences were charmed by Japanese aesthetics, uh, which seemed so different uh, to them. The story is now so widely told as accepted as an article of faith that the Impressionist painters of France really discovered that Japanese aesthetic uh, when crates full of Japanese uh, pottery were shipped uh, to Europe. Uh, the pottery wasn't what, inter wasn't what interested them, it was the woodblock prints that were crumpled up and used as packing materials to pack the pottery for shipment that they found absolutely stunning and inspiring. It's like a whole group of artists, perhaps in a different galaxy, finding styrofoam packing peanuts uh, and saying, wow, uh, this is changing my world. <laughs> Japanese tattoos at the time were also a big deal. Uh, you know, now I don't think uh, most of us consider tattoos as being sort of this height of the Japanese aesthetic sensibility. Uh, and yet at the time, uh, Western travelers to Japan found these fascinating and the great souvenir of the day uh, for those few Westerners uh, who were brave enough to go to Japan was to come back uh, with a tattoo. Uh, and as you might guess from these de descriptions, this first impact of Japanese culture and popular culture on the West was mainly among the Western elite. Okay? It would spread gradually through society, through artistic movements like Japonisme, but at the beginning it was the Western elite uh, finding something uh, thrilling uh, in Japan. At the same time, the flow very much went the other way as well. Western clothing, Western hairstyles became commonplace in Japan. Unfamiliar musical forms and instruments were introduced, and numerous Western customs, uh, anything from team sports like baseball to culinary practices like the widespread eating of meat, uh, were introduced into Japan through new government institutions like schools uh, and a modern military. And so, as I mentioned, one of the important things to keep in mind as we look at Japanese popular culture and even think about that idea of quote unquote Japanese popular culture is that from the very start uh, this process of dialogue and hybridization uh, was uh, extremely strong. Just as Americans and Europeans uh, reveled in the Japanese aesthetics of gardens and prints and tattoos, uh, so Japanese society embraced but also transformed things like baseball, western food, jazz, radio melodramas, and especially, as we'll come to see, things like comic books, animation, and action movies to better fit into a Japanese context. So in addition to that history of popular culture, another thing that is striking about Japanese popular culture is its sheer diversity and richness. Now there are only about 125 million Japanese language speakers worldwide, which is, is of course a small fraction of the number of speakers of English or Spanish or Mandarin. Yet the Japanese entertainment industry has, since World War II, produced a range and variety of entertainment products surpassed only, if I believe at all, uh, by the United States. Just listing the various forms and genres and niches of Japanese pop products is an exhausting business, running the range from movies, music, video games, and television to less obvious areas where Japan has had a significant global impact, from character goods like Hello Kitty, foods like sushi and ramen, activities like karaoke and sudoku, and areas that don't make it into college classrooms very often, like pornography. Manga and anime provide wonderful examples of the profusion of specialized audiences that Japanese pop culture addresses. Japanese comic books, for example, are not just segmented 
uh, for major audience demographics like age and gender, so they're not just men's and women's, younger and older and so forth, but are well known for focusing on an almost unthinkable range of reader obsessions, from sci-fi, romance, adventure, and history, to golf, cooking, fortune-telling, travel, and how-to guides. Uh, and, you know, here is just, this is just a random sample of things that came to mind uh, as I was pulling images off the internet uh, for the PowerPoint. You know, seafood flavored Kit Kat bars, uh, and, uh, which I hope will not become a global commodity. Uh, and, and, you know, one of those great examples of Japanese pop culture that everyone in Japan immediately knows what we're looking at, but people abroad are often will scratch their head. Uh, 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 Mito Komon, sort of this great historical uh, series uh, of dramas on Japanese uh, TV, uh, which uh, Japanese audiences seem never to tire of and yet has never gotten much traction uh, overseas. Now, one way to demonstrate the incredible lushness of the Japanese pop culture landscape is to look briefly at the career of one of the legends of Japanese manga and anime, a man named Tezuka. Osamu. Tezuka was an incredibly prolific uh, artist, author, uh, 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 animator, and entrepreneur over, career, over a career stretching from the end of World War II until his death uh, in 1989. Tezuka is probably best known in the United States for creating the animated character Astro Boy, uh, known as Tetsuan Atom in Japan. Uh, in 1963, Astro Boy became the first Japanese animated series ever to appear on American television. But Tezuka's output uh, was truly phenomenal in quantity, quality, and range of subject matters. He created a staggering 150,000 manga pages, 700 volumes of manga, 60 animated films and series, and a host of iconic characters from the Jungle Emperor, known to U.S. audiences as Kimba the White Lion, to Black Jack, uh, a shadowy illegal surgeon. Ranging widely across styles and genres, he was as comfortable penning sci-fi epics and light-hearted animal tales as hard-edged suspense stories, historical dramas, softcore pornography, adaptations of Russian and German novels, and amazingly, a multi-volume manga biography of the Buddha, Tezuka's imagination, popular appeal, and sheer productivity mirrored the booming Japanese pop culture industry after World War II. Uh, and a very neat source is a manga biography of Tezuka, uh, which I listed on that additional reading sheet uh, that I handed out, that just came out about uh, a year ago, that really chronicles uh, all the many amazing contributions uh, he made. Point number three. So Japanese pop culture taps into historical anxieties. The question always comes up, where did this tremendous creativity of Japanese pop culture come from? What is the engine driving uh, Japanese uh, uh, folks in the Japanese entertainment industry to have created this richness uh, of material over the decades since World War II? Now, what might be considered the current mainstream academic view on this issue is rooted in history, specifically the Japanese experience of war, the atomic bombings, defeat in 1945, and then subservience to the United States uh, in the post-war settlement afterwards. In recent years, the most outspoken advocate of this general interpretation, uh, this idea that Japan's pop culture imagination emerged from those mushroom clouds over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, has been the well-known Japanese pop artist Murakami Takashi. Now, in Murakami's op uh, opinion, the Japanese people have never fully come to terms with defeat, occupation by the United States, and this pattern of post-war dominance of America that has left Japan and the Japanese people somehow deformed, somehow not quite right, and also perpetually infantilized, always the junior partner in this relationship. 
Since the frank and open discussion of the war's effects, particularly the legacy of a relationship with the United States where Japan is endlessly the weaker power, has been really taboo in post-war Japan. It's been hard to talk about a lot of these issues. It's been hard for the Japanese people to address wartime memories, to address the experience of defeat, uh, to really look deeply uh, at the atomic attacks, and then to question and uh, critique the relationship with America. Murakami has argued that it has fallen to Japanese pop culture to take on this role to address the traumas that Japan has faced over the past 70 years and seek to find answers, seek to move towards some kind uh, of closure. Now in Murakami's view there have been two imaginative outcomes from this struggle, uh, uh, this dealing with the past in contemporary Japan. The first is the sense that the Japanese have been rendered monstrous by the A-bombs, defeat, and post-war acquiescence. And you'll see this theme of the mushroom cloud uh, is a very uh, powerful one uh, in Murakami's art. Uh, he talks about champs, and, and champs is his short version of champignon, French for mushroom, okay? So this reference back to the mushroom cloud. Murakami wrote the following, a pervasive impotence defines the culture of post-war Japan where everything is peaceful, tranquil, lukewarm. Our general removal from world politics and distorted dependence on the U.S. leaves us in a circumscribed, closed-in system, inhabiting an Orwellian science fiction realm. We are deformed monsters, less than human in the eyes of the humans of the West. Not surprisingly, then, coming from that vantage point, Murakami suggests that the prevalence of monsters, things like Godzilla, things like Pokemon, the pocket monsters, in the Japanese pop imagination, are a reflection of this profound sense of deformity at the core of the nation's post-war identity. Okay, and therefore, working out Japan's uh, uh, issues uh, with this place it has held in the post-war world. Murakami's second significant observation is that in the wake of World War II, Japan has considered itself and been regarded by the world as a child. For the past 60 years, he wrote, Japan has been a testing ground for an American-style capitalist economy, protected in a greenhouse, nurtured and bloated to the point of explosion. The results are so bizarre, they're perfect. We Japanese are truly, deeply pampered children. And as pampered children, we throw constant tantrums when enthralled by our own cuteness. So dependent on America politically, economically, and culturally, Japan has been infantilized as a nation, unwilling and unable to assert itself in the world. At the same time, Murakami asserts, the Japanese people have actively embraced childishness, withdrawing from reality to seek refuge in juvenile fantasies. Thus, Japanese pop has not just been filled with monsters like Godzilla, but also with an abundance of cuteness that symbolizes Japan's ongoing subservience to the United States, as well as its desire to escape imaginatively into a world of youthful, irresponsible innocence. Now, I, like many scholars, you know, whenever you hear a grand theory, right, you begin to poke holes in it, okay? It's the nature uh, of, uh, of scholars. Uh, I find lots of problems uh, with Murakami's uh, arguments, uh, but there's also something very compelling uh, about uh, his observations. Uh, uh, in some cases, the imprint of history uh, and uh, the Japanese traumas uh, experienced at Hiroshima and Nagasaki are very obvious, right? So if you watch the Godzilla films, uh, that historical baggage 
uh, of uh, the atomic attacks is very, very palpable. Okay? So the Godzilla film started in 1954. 29 films in the series made in Japan between 1954 and, and last year. Uh, and you know, uh, if you look at that, you can say, sure, I can see how Hiroshima and Nagasaki are playing out there. There are other places, though, and I think a lot of people would say, oh, you know, I watch a lot of Japanese pop culture. I'm not seeing the shadow of the A-bombs really coloring these works. Sometimes one can be surprised by what one sees. And so what I'm going to do now is just show a short clip from one of those unlikely places. How, how many of you have seen uh, the uh, animated film uh, uh, My Neighbor Totoro? Great one, right? This is, you know, if you have kids, you've probably seen this, okay? Because this is one of the most beautiful, in fact, hauntingly beautiful Japanese anime ever made. And I think captures the spirit of childhood as well as any creative uh, work I have ever uh, watched or read or heard. Uh, it's a story uh, of a couple young girls who have moved with their father to an old farmhouse in the countryside one summer while their mother is recovering uh, from tuberculosis uh, in a hospital. Uh, and we start here uh, with the two young girls having sent a letter to their mother uh, in hospital. Uh, the key thing to notice in this is the way the girls develop a relationship with a mountain spirit, a Totoro, which we will see here, that only they can see. The father cannot see the Totoro, it is the girls and their imagination uh, that brings this uh, spirit, this creature, uh, to life. And this is uh, quite a magical uh, sequence we are going to see here, but don't, think, uh, don't forget Murakami as we are watching it. So I had a, a professor who specializes in Japanese video games say to me after I talked about this, I've watched Totoro 15 times and now you've ruined it for me forever. Uh, <laughs> And it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I still can't tell you what it means. Uh, and yet, you know, there's a mushroom cloud uh, in there. And it, it you know, uh, it, it, it changes one's views. Point number four. So not only is history playing out through Japanese popular culture, but Japanese popular culture, of course, also reflects contemporary debates and pressing issues. And this is pretty obvious for popular culture everywhere, that it taps not just into the past, but also what's onto people's minds uh, when it is made. And a great example of that is to look at the Godzilla series, because we can see how this is played out over the course uh, of decades. The early films in the series from the 1950s uh, uh, were very dark and somber, of course, not just reflecting uh, uh, memories of World War II and the atomic bombings, but also reflecting where Japan was uh, at that time. Japan in the 1950s was a very poor place, uh, recovering from the economic devastation of defeat. It was also a very vulnerable place, caught between uh, the United States uh, and uh, uh, Japan. Uh, United States and uh, Soviet Union, uh, rather, uh, during the Cold War. By the 1960s, though, things had changed. Japan was recovering uh, economically. It was growing more confident uh, internationally. Uh, and as a result, audiences didn't really want to see Godzilla destroying Japan's new, modern, uh, advanced cities. So instead then of becoming this ominous presence and with this sort of dark cloud over the series, Godzilla became more upbeat. The monster became more of a hero and took more to defending Japan from things like dangerous crustaceans on the loose uh, than uh, being uh, a, a kind of conscience uh, or threat uh, to Japan. Uh, so uh, the films became uh, uh, more comic, uh, more aimed uh, at kids. Over the decades, Godzilla commented on many of the themes that obsessed the so Japanese society after the war consumerism, political corruption, even issues like school bullying, environmental issues, and pollution. In the 1980s and 1990s, uh, the series dealt with issues like the impact of growing wealth on Japanese society, on fading memories of World War II, on the revival of Japanese nationalism, and of the place uh, of the military uh, in Japanese society. 
The most recent Japanese film, which was made uh, in 2016, uh, which was the first uh, Godzilla film since the triple disasters uh, of 2011, uh, earthquake, tsunami, uh, and meltdown uh, at Fukushima, uh, also proved to be very timely uh, and topical. If you haven't seen it, uh, let me encourage you uh, to see it. Uh, it addresses both the trauma of vast, unpredictable natural disasters, but also, interestingly, uh, the profound frustration in Japan and around the world uh, in uh, uh, political gridlock and government ineptitude. Uh, in a review of the movie that I wrote, I said the makers could have called it Godzilla versus the establishment. Uh, and the good news for Japan is Godzilla wins uh, that one. Now, you could trace the topicality of Japanese pop culture through any number of forms, but Godzilla is just a convenient one. Japanese pop culture can be dark and pessimistic. Okay? One commentator has described Japanese pop culture as being filled with doom-laden dreams. And it's hard to avoid the fascination in post-war Japanese pop, especially manga, anime, video games, movies, TV, and popular fiction, with mass destruction, with apocalypse, and with the devastation of Japanese cities, especially with Tokyo. And this is from the original Godzilla film. Scholars have written of Japan's imagination of disaster and the utter bleakness of the worlds depicted in Japanese science fiction, contrasting what some have called the nihilistic tone and profound pessimism of Japan's Armageddon fantasies with the less gloomy versions of the present and the future served up by Hollywood. So let me just give you a couple examples here, and this is very selective. You could talk for a long time uh, about the sort of darkness in Japanese pop culture. Uh, Godzilla is a classic example uh, of this, uh, especially those 1950s films, uh, but one uh, that commentators often point to is Ultraman. Uh, Ultraman began in the mid-1960s. It was made by the same special effects guru who made the original Godzilla movie. Uh, uh, it's essentially the story of a superhero, sort of half-human, half-cyborg alien creature uh, that defends Japan uh, against weekly onslaughts of giant monsters. This was a weekly TV show for children. It's been running essentially ever since the 1960s. And the storyline for the first couple decades was every week a new big monster would come from somewhere, from outer space, from the ocean, down from the hills, destroy parts of Tokyo, Ultraman would come, drive them back, and save Japan. Uh, so, uh, you know, while uh, people have been obsessed with how filmmakers have enjoyed destroying Los Angeles and New York City uh, on the screen, uh, you know, for much of the post-war period, Tokyo was being destroyed every week uh, in Ultraman. Anime offers much that is pessimistic uh, to, uh, 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 to dote on. Uh, uh, one of the great series, the most uh, influential series of all time, was Space Battleship Yamato, uh, uh, imported to this country as Star Blazers, uh, originally from the mid-1970s. Uh, the storyline in this is it's the year 2199. The Earth is under attack by a planet called Gamelus, which has just been sort of lobbing uh, nuclear weapons uh, at us uh, for generations. The uh, surface of the Earth is completely uninhabitable uh, from being hit uh, by these H-bombs. And so to save themselves, humans over time have moved further and further in to the crust of the Earth. At some point, though, it becomes crunch time. Uh, because they can't go any deeper, and yet Gamelus keeps lobbing those bombs in. So all appears to be lost, humankind appears to be doomed, when suddenly a message is received from the distant planet of Iskandar, saying, we see your plight, we have a device that will help you clean up your planet, all you have to do is come and get it, here are the plans for an intergalactic spacecraft which you can build. The weirdest thing, of course, about the intergalactic spacecraft is it is built inside the hull of the World War II Japanese battleship Yamato. Okay? So they raise the Yamato, they build this spaceship, they face all these challenges going to Iskandar, but they get the device called Cosmo Cleaner D uh, and bring it uh, back to Earth. 
The mother of all Japanese disaster films was a novel subsequently made into a movie called Japan Sinks. Uh, uh, and the title pretty much says it all. Uh, due to tectonic shifts, uh, uh, it is posited Japan simply sinks into the Pacific Ocean. Okay? So this is a great theme for a movie for a couple reasons. First, it allows for some wonderful special effects, right? Showing Japan literally crumbling and being consumed by volcanoes as it slips uh, into the drink. But then it raises the question of what happens to the Japanese people. Okay? If your country is disappearing, what happens to your people and what happens to your culture? And this was one of the biggest Japanese movie blockbusters uh, of all time. And then finally, I want to just mention, yeah, Rand. What's happened to the Japanese culture? You know, uh, there, there's a great uh, uh, scene in there where they're bargaining with the Australian Prime Minister. Because Australia has nothing if not space, you know, uh, to resettle all the Japanese people. Uh, and uh, he wants all the Japanese antiquities uh, for Australia if they're going to take people. Uh, but ultimately, the movie ends with that sort of hopeful line is, now is the time to test ourselves as a people and to see, even as we're scattered around the world, if our culture can survive. So it really ends with a challenge rather than an answer. And then this is perhaps the greatest, you know, darkest of the Japanese uh, uh, anime ever, Akira, uh, about, uh, uh, it's set in the future as well in a place called Neo-Tokyo. Neo-Tokyo is a reconstruction of Tokyo built after Tokyo was destroyed in some unspoken Armageddon uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and uh, it's about cults. Uh, it's about biker gangs, it's about government thought control experiments, and it ends with Neo-Tokyo in turn being consumed by another uh, apocalypse, uh, and then presumably having to be rebuilt again. So Japanese pop culture can be pretty darn dark, but it can also be escapist, therapeutic, and optimistic. And this to me is sort of like that paradox, right? People often talk about how violent Japanese popular culture is, and yet Japan is one of the least violent places in the world, okay? Uh, and there are the times in American history where we have reveled in blaming violence in our society on what Hollywood put on screens uh, in front of us, and yet it doesn't seem to hold up uh, in the Japanese uh, case. Uh, so it is with sort of darkness uh, and lightness. Uh, I've written at length uh, about this, in particular, and this a uh, citation is on the list of additional readings uh, I gave you, uh, that when I see something like Ultraman uh, or something like Akira, uh, you know, uh, rather than seeing the city falling down, what I see is the city being miraculously rebuilt. And that in this process in which Japan is, and especially Tokyo, are compulsively destroyed on a regular basis, what is striking to me is viewers' faith in the self-healing quality of this place we call Japan, uh, in regeneration, in progress, okay, in the modern project, and in the nation of Japan. So when I see these films, I don't see something particularly dark, but I see something that at its core has a lot of hope built into it, because Tokyo is always miraculously regenerating and always a little bit better than it was before. I'll also note the Japanese have a very wry sense of humor about their apocalyptic obsession. So there are a number of very clever takeoffs on disaster and giant monster pictures which have been made in recent decades. One movie pivoting off Japan sinks, and Japan Sinks was remade as a blockbuster film in 2006, came out in 2007, and that was called The World Sinks Except Japan. <laughs> and so the premise of this movie is, what if those tectonic plates made all the other continents go underwater, what would the Japanese do in this case? Well, the end point of this movie is, and it might not surprise you, is when the people from the rest of the world all crowd into already crowded Japan, it too grows so heavy, it sinks under the water, okay? And so it ends with everyone dead. <laughs> I should note there are huge amounts of light, upbeat entertainment churned out in Japan. 
uh, especially for youth audiences and for women. And again, these are sort of randomly uh, chosen uh, examples. Uh, on the left-hand side is a Japanese character who, again, in Japan, every person on the street knows who Anpan Man is, uh, you know, uh, uh, red bean paste bun man. His head is a, essentially a jelly donut filled with bean paste. Uh, and he's a children's superhero uh, who fights a villain named uh, Baikinman, which means germ man. Uh, you know, and it's just, you know, sort of wonderful, silly, uh, childish stuff. Doraemon, the robotic cat, uh, who's sort of based off Felix the Cat, Sailor Moon there. There's a lot of lightweight uh, stuff out there, too. And then, of course, there's that aesthetic of cute uh, we mentioned already. There is lots of debate around cute. We could talk for a whole hour about cute. Is this escapism? Or is this somehow subversive? Is it a tonic for the stresses of post-war Japanese society? Is it about the empowerment of women, which some argue? Or is it about the infantilization of women? Or indeed, I think, as we would come to the conclusion at the end of this hour, is it about all those things and more? Okay? It's a very complex uh, phenomenon, uh, but goes very different ways uh, from that sort of nihilistic tone in so much of an apocalyptic Japanese sci-fi. Number seven. A lot of Japanese traditional culture plays in uh, to uh, Japanese pop culture, but it also addresses universals as well. So aspects of Japan's deep traditions in artistic expression Folklore and social life certainly have shaped and spurred the evolution of cool Japan as a global phenomenon. The writing system is often pointed to that has uh, contributed to the graphic quality uh, of Japanese popular culture, that this heritage uh, of doing drawings uh, when they write uh, has made them more sensitive uh, uh, to graphic uh, uh, sensibilities. There's a long tradition in Japan of artistic forms that look to our eyes a lot like manga that combine uh, drawing and uh, text uh, in creative ways. There's an extraordinarily rich cultural heritage of monsters uh, in Japan and folklore uh, around beings called yokai, uh, which is a very interesting topic in its own right. And then there's the uh, issue of Japanese attitudes towards the natural world. And this is one of those stereotypes that makes a lot of people, including me, uh, wince, especially now uh, since the Japanese government is promoting this very strongly uh, as uh, uh, part of its uh, 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 soft power uh, strategies uh, around uh, pop culture uh, globally, uh, to impress upon international audiences this idea that the Japanese have a unique appreciation and respect for the natural uh, world. Nonetheless, even if we question that, we do see it played out in a number of pop culture products like uh, uh, Miyazaki uh, uh, anime. So clearly there is something in this argument of traditional cultural roots to Japanese pop, but of course it can't explain everything. Uh, you know, I talked about Tezuka Osama, Osamu earlier, the creator of Astro Boy. Uh, you know, uh, he might have been influenced by Japanese traditional culture. It's also said he watched Bambi 80 times uh, before he made his first cartoon, uh, because he was so deeply, uh, profoundly influenced uh, by Walt Disney. Uh, and then movies like Godzilla were very much considered knockoffs of King Kong, Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and so forth when they come out. When they came out, significantly. Some authors have argued further that what makes Japanese pop culture so appealing internationally is the way that it taps into universal values, even while retaining some Japanese aesthetic or cultural flavor. And I certainly found this when I did my Godzilla book. As part of that, I surveyed fans around the country about why they like Godzilla. Very, very few people pointed to the monster's Japanese origins as something they liked about Godzilla. More often than not, they spoke to universal values that they felt Godzilla epitomized, such as strength, heroism, somebody willing to stand up for something he believes in, someone who's strong and successful. 
Okay? So Godzilla to them spoke to these universal truths. Some authors have also pointed to other universals that draw American audiences to Japanese pop products. Themes of love, friendship, magic, fantasy, the relationship with the divine, and ambivalence towards technology and human relationships with technology that tend to play out quite a bit in Japanese pop culture and are of interest uh, globally. A few scholars have even argued that it is the distinctively un-Japanese nature of Japanese pop culture that has made Japanese pop so successful internationally. And the foremost scholar who argues this is uh, this guy Iwabuchi Koichi, uh, who uh, put forward the idea that pop culture has a smell, that every pop culture product that is introduced into the marketplace and sent abroad has a smell to it. Okay. For American goods being sent abroad, so Hollywood movies, for example, that smell is a good one. It's an aroma, if you will, a fragrance uh, that is positive. And the reason is because when international audiences see a Hollywood movie, they get this whole bundle of American values that go with it. This yearning for American freedom and wealth and coolness. Okay? So a pop culture product carries this cultural baggage of its origin nation in its scent. Well, Iwabuchi says, if Hollywood products smell good because they smell of America, Japanese products smell bad. Okay? If something seems too Japanese, foreign consumers are less likely to want it. Because if you're an Asian uh, 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 media consumer looking at a Japanese product, that smell might remind you of World War II or colonialism. If you're in the West, it might remind you uh, of stereotypes you have uh, about Asians and, and Japanese in particular. So Iwabuchi argues it has only been those Japanese cultural products that have been scrupulously scrubbed clean of their Japanese-ness that are universal in their appeal that have been successful. And the term many scholars have used to describe this is mukokuseki, so that is lacking in a clear sense of national origin. And Iwabuchi says in the Japanese case it comes down to the three C's. Consumer technology, so that's hardware, right? Who can tell what nation uh, a VCR or a Walkman came from, okay? Comics and cartoons, so uh, things like anime and manga where the Japanese origins, he argues, are uh, uh, pretty well disguised by their Japanese creators, and then computer games. Now, Iwabuchi's ideas are quite provocative and controversial. I think his approach really does help us with something like Hello Kitty, okay, uh, which I think as much as anything is an odorless, cultural, uh, odorless a cultural commodity uh, as you can get. The same might be said of Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, but I'm somewhat skeptical of Iwabuchi's notions of smell, as I really wonder just how Mukokuseki an odorless something like anime is, even if, as we know, so many of the characters of anime do not look particularly Japanese uh, with their blue hair uh, and gigantic round purple eyes. These reservations aside, those ideas of something being odorless are clearly worthy of attention. Let me just run through my, as I said, I get to eight, uh, which is about right. Uh, this is an obvious one. Japanese pop culture has a long history in the United States. One reason, I think, why we've responded so strongly over the past three decades or so to Japanese pop is because we have had Japanese pop in this country for generations. Uh, uh, it started with Godzilla in the 1950s, moved through things like this. Uh, Speed Racer uh, got me numerous tardies uh, when I was in elementary school because uh, I wanted to watch it on TV before I caught the bus. Uh, and uh, for a lot of folks, this is an earlier generation than me, it was going to the drive-in theater uh, and seeing uh, Japanese monster movies or sci-fi pictures uh, on the big screen. And much of this was driven by economics, uh, that uh, uh, American media companies needed content. Japanese content was cheap. It was reasonably accessible with a little bit of dubbing, uh, and American audiences would accept it. 
Subsequently then, Japan was found to be an inexpensive place to make popular culture, so Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was made uh, in Japan, uh, and this became a brain worm for so many of us, I think, growing up uh, in that age. And then it became ubiquitous uh, later uh, through media like uh, the Cartoon Network, uh, which brought things, uh, and other forms that brought cable TV that brought uh, Iron Chef uh, to America. Even with the weight of history, it is not entirely clear why American audiences love Japanese pop culture so much. A number of arguments have been put forward. Some have said it's because of the quality uh, and uh, the innovation in Japanese pop. Uh, skeptics would say, boy, there's a whole lot of Japanese pop culture that is not very high quality and not very imaginative. Some people stress dis difference and sophistication, uh, that Japanese pop culture is sort of a tonic for the very predictable narratives of Hollywood, uh, the sugar-coated happy endings uh, of Disney and so forth, and the sort of darkness of Japanese pop culture, and the, uh, a bit more of the mystery about Japanese pop uh, makes it uh, appealing. Some would stress uh, uh, marketing. Uh, that if you look at products uh, like uh, Hello Kitty, uh, like Pokemon, like Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, it is the Japanese genius uh, for marketing products, essentially by saturation techniques, by making sure that no medium is uh, 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 free uh, from a product uh, being forced upon uh, consumers. Japanese really pioneered this in the 1960s in their home market, when not only did you do an animated TV series of Astro Boy, you did manga, uh, you did uh, uh, product placement, uh, you did uh, souvenir goods, uh, you know, you did games, everything revolved, you did uh, advertising campaigns for other products, everything revolved around the product you were selling. And this is called the media mix. Uh, and this, I think, helps us explain why uh, Japanese pop culture has done so well here as well. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to ask you this question of what does the future of Japanese pop culture look like? And I hope this is something everybody can reflect on. I ask audiences quite often about this, uh, many of which uh, are student audiences, and I get a very mixed response. Is Japanese popular culture headed up in the United States, or has it peaked, and is it coming down? There is, of course, a great deal of competition out there now, notably from Korea. Okay, the Korean wave uh, uh, has uh, offered a lot of competition uh, to Japan's uh, place in international uh, pop culture. Another challenge to Japan uh, is the weak economics of the popular culture industries uh, in Japan. And two examples I would give where the Japanese have not been able to cash in on what they have done are karaoke, invented by Japanese and yet profited from by people uh, around the world, and Sudoku, uh, which was actually invented in the United States, but it was popularized uh, by a company called Nikolai, uh, but they never trademarked Sudoku. Uh, and so they never realized all the benefit uh, of every grandma on every airplane in America uh, playing these games. One of the things that is striking, and I wish I could talk more about this, is the role of the Japanese government today in promoting pop culture as a form of soft power for the Japanese state. And as I think you can guess from looking at this picture, nothing guarantees that something is uncool, like having a Japanese bureaucrat in the picture. Okay? that my worry is that the Japanese state is going to kill Japanese pop culture by loving it too much. Okay? Uh, and I could tell you stories uh, about how this is playing out, I think, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Galapagos syndrome, the idea that Japanese are too inward looking, you know, and are not focused enough on the outside world is a threat as well. And then here's the biggest threat. So much of Japanese pop culture has been youth culture, in a few years, there won't be any more youth left in Japan. So who are they going to be making pop culture for? Okay. So just the demographics of pop culture consumption in Japan do not bode well for the industry and the creativity. And now I've done. A and emojis and emoticons could be their own talk uh, as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>